Hola, eh, yo soy Axel Bautista. Hi, I'm Alex Garner. And this is Impact's American Beauty Podcast. This is our final episode. Sidoso Poderoso and the power when living with HIV. In this episode, we're going to talk about the HIV from the perspective of pride, political resistance, and the power of the community. It's also an invitation to continue breaking borders, rompiendo las fronteras, to liberate our identity, pleasure, gender, and sexuality. This time, Alex and I will be the hosts and the guests. So, welcome to this final episode, and let's start with the conversation. Hello, Alex. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm fine. Um, well, this is our last episode of American Beauty Podcast. How do you feel? Um, I think it's been an exciting and interesting journey to engage with a variety of people about these diverse topics and better understand the experience of being queer and Latinx in the U.S.? Well, yes, and I think there is just one topic that we are just missing, and I think it's very important to address in this podcast, which um, I think is very personal for me. I don't know for you, but it's, it's about HIV and the experience of living with HIV when we are queer Latinos in the U.S. or in Mexico. I think I would start with HIV uh, or with the importance of making visible the experience of living with HIV when you're a queer person, especially if you're Latino or Latinx living in the U.S. Because I think when we talk about HIV, we always forget about the diversity of queer people that is um, living with HIV, especially in the U.S. You know, we sort of like see pictures of white folks or even like women, but we never see that diversity that is behind that, which I'm guessing, I don't know if you have more experience in the U.S., but I'm guessing it's, it's different when we talk about Latinos and Latinx. It's different to an extent. And the reason why it's different is because of a lack of visibility and a lack of data and information. Mm. So there's been a lot of good data demonstrating how black gay men have been impacted by HIV. Got a lot of press coverage, got a lot of engagement from the community, and it really motivated people and policymakers to take action. We haven't had the same type of conclusive data around queer, gay, Latinos in the U.S. We have it. It hasn't gotten the same sort of leverage and attention. Um, and it seems impossible to talk about HIV and Latinos in the U.S. and not talk about immigration and not talk about the fact that there's still a subpopulation of people that don't have access mm. to health care, even with Obamacare. Mm. Uh, migrants, as policy, migrants are excluded. In certain cities and states, they're not. But the idea that we have an entire subpopulation of people who still don't have access to health care, and many of them are Latinos, that has a profound impact on HIV in the U.S. Mm. But all of these things are overlooked uh, or simply not discussed in the context of HIV in the U.S. But now that you talk about migration, and as we mentioned in our first episode, this is in this podcast, we were talking episode by episode about those borders that we cross as Latinos, queer, um, with many gender expressions, you know? And I think uh, HIV is another border about between like health and illness, if we want to call it like that, that we never mention how this impacts your life, especially in this, in your sex life. How is it a border? Elaborate. Uh, I would say that um, as a society, as a society, we always think that, or we always benefit health, and we what we consider a disease or what we consider as illness, we always see that part as negative or like as something bad, you know. And I think HIV is you know that border that when you cross it, you cross 
to the bad side, even though we don't know that. We know that it's not like that, you know, but like culturally, it means crossing a border and you need to live your life now from that side of, um, of the reality, you know? I think what we need to do is like to change that narrative, you know, and try to change like, you know, the, um, that that side is not that negative part of the world. It's just, you know, like it's, a, it's something, it's another reality. That's, that's all, you know, it's another condition. And you can still enjoy your sex life and everything with that. My perspective about addressing HIV as a border is like trying to show that what is behind that border is is actually still good, you know, it's not negative. And probably many people would say, how could you say that it's good? I mean, what I'm trying to say is it's not a tragedy. And I think that part of the story, if we want to call it like that, or the other side of the moon, we never show it to the world, to society, especially when we talk about queer Latinos with HIV. Because I think the narrative about queer Latinos with HIV, it's always about blaming themselves or blaming, always like blaming to them about like, oh, you got it because you, you were irresponsible, you know, or because that's how your people live or because, um, I don't know, there's like many associations with racism, with, uh, discrimination with homophobia, of course, you know, and I think it would be great to also focus on the bright side of that part without stereotyping. Throughout this podcast, we've talked about what identity means mm -hmm. and HIV and being HIV positive has become an identity in a different way than something like disability has for us. Mm -hmm. Right. There is a certainly an identity associated with disabilities, but in a different way. And the need for identity is cultural okay. and political, okay. and it's a response to the conditions around us. So choosing to call yourself a Chicano, for example, is about politicizing your identity. Choosing to call yourself a Sidoso is about politicizing your identity. So in the context of HIV and for, for queer Latinos in the U.S., the challenge is how do we elevate that identity so that more people are aware of the complexities that go along with it, that more people's voices are represented who, who are part of that, that community. And the political leverage that comes along with it. And I think you made a point. There's always been this idea that when people get sick or that there's a health condition, that there's someone to blame, in particular, certain communities. Same. Obviously with HIV, it was gay men. To a lesser extent, it was poor people and drug users men and people. black people or Haitians, immigrants. Haitians in particular. And we saw the exact same thing happen with COVID, where you had these places where, for example, people that worked in meat packing plants that were still open during the shutdown mm. uh, because people needed food, they were getting sick. And instead of policymakers responding in a way to mitigate, to better mitigate the risks, they blamed it on things like cultural differences. <laughs> and the majority of people who worked in these plants were Latinos. If not all of them. And so that's always been the case. That's the narrative of American history is that if something happens to one group, it's their fault and their blame. Crack cocaine was seen as something about black people, mm. but the opioid epidemic was seen as a health concern because yeah. it impacted largely white people. So with HIV and Latinos, what needs to still happen is for there to be a clearer sense of visibility and representation. Because I think that's what we've been lacking. And leadership. It's what we've been lacking from the community domestically to really speak in a more complex way yeah. 
about each of you. See, that's what I was, that's what I was going to say because I think um, um, we can have a lot of type of leaders or leaderships in the activism focus on HIV, of course, you know, but like, I think, uh, and this is an example from Latin America, I guess the US is sort of similar. Most of the leaderships are like focus on prevention, which is, of course, necessary and is okay, you know, but I think we need to go further with visibility, which has to be more about like showing the real experience of living with HIV beyond, further or beyond mm -hmm prevention of, you know like and I think this podcast we sort of did it not with HIV but with other realities about like you know the experience of being a queer Latino Latinx you know we talk about sex we talk about uh, body empowerment to be sexy we talk about identity and I think those things are missing when we address the HIV issue in in general we always reduce everything to oh I need to take these pills or blah 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 but we never go like um to the power of, to the power that you can have after you get your diagnosis. So with queer Latinos and HIV, I think what's unfortunately happened is that it's an extension of this narrative of people living with HIV as patients. Mm. And so it's seen as a very clinical topic and it's approached it's almost always approached from this idea of, oh, how do Latinos interact with their healthcare provider? Claro. And so what's lacking is a complex understanding of the entire person. In particular, obviously for queer Latinos, but there's a need to, for, to better understand Latinos in general in the U.S. <laughs> in terms of who we are as a community. But when you're talking about queer people with HIV... Yeah. Then it's even more important because we have a response, a healthcare response and a political response around a topic that doesn't understand the community they're supposed to be addressing or fighting for. Mm -hmm. And this community of queer Latinx people living with HIV is diverse and complex and the issues are more than just whether or not you have access to a pill that you take every day. It's how you decide to control your body. Um, whether that's in terms of sex and pleasure, whether that's in terms of doing sex work, sure. uh, whether that's in terms of moving across the border, all of it is interconnected. And most of it is interconnected around our bodies and what we choose mm -hmm. to do with them and in the u.s black and brown bodies are politicized are policed are criminalized criminalized if you think and so i would suggest that the root of this needed movement is really around our individual bodies because all the issues migration sexuality gender expression, sex work, all of the things that we've talked about in these podcasts, it all comes back to body. what you want to do with your body. And would you say that it's possible to have a liberation, body liberation, pleasure liberation, sexual liberation, when you live with HIV? I mean, because apparently when, you know, like, about, I don't know, body positivity, gender expression, and all those things can feel sometimes more easy, probably. You know, like, oh, I can just own my gender expression, or I can just own my um, my body type or whatever, you know. Uh, but again, you know, sort of this border of HIV is like sometimes full of fear about like, oh, people is gonna see me as the danger you know as a danger for society as yes, something bad i mean i would argue that when it comes to accepting your body or your gender expression it's not necessarily easier mm -hmm. people have to do a lot of work and they're still doing the work i think the difference with hiv is often 
there's not space to do the work. Doing the work isn't necessarily encouraged or seen as part of the process of living with HIV. You get diagnosed, you go to the doctor, you get your pills, mm -hmm. and you take them, and you continue to take them, and you wave a flag about U equals U, and that's <laughs> it, right? You're a good patient now. Exactly, and that's all you're seen as. Yeah. But if you're a whore, if you're, you have an open, expressive sex life and sexuality, mm -hmm. it becomes problematic, mm -hmm. it becomes dangerous. Mm -hmm. And if you're unashamed of your HIV, dare I say proud of your HIV, people will feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to respond to it or what to do with it. And so I guess our challenge is how do we make space? You know, we've talked to all of these people on this podcast and they've communicated their challenges with sort of coming to a stronger sense of who they are, mm -hmm. why that matters, its power, its, its impact. And HIV is the exact same way. And so the question becomes, how do we create space for that to happen? How do we give people the skills or encouragement to do that? How do other people demonstrate that or lead by example in, in terms of doing that? And I think that's what helps because this border that you are talking about is also a closet. See. And so border closet is basically the same thing, but mm -hmm. living in HIV is just a second closet. And all of the bad things that come with living in the closet, the harm that it does to you, is harm that people living with HIV that we experience when we're living in an HIV closet. I think one of the most successful things that our community, our queer community has done, has been this coming out movement See. that happened in the 60s and 70s and 80s and certainly HIV accelerated that because people had to come out because physically it was apparent that they were sick and in many ways it was obvious that they were gay and so the coming out movement accelerated because of HIV and we see the benefits of that in something like gay marriage for example as problematic as that might be but there's no discounting the fact that the movement to come out as a queer person was successful and had an impact. It changed things. So we can learn from that movement around HIV because the question is why is there not a similar coming out movement around HIV? And not coming out in terms of being a good, respectable person living with HIV, which is what queer coming out turned into mm -hmm. like um, love, is, love is love and tolerance like and love and tolerance and, and, uh -huh. and marriage sometimes what marriage a marriage yeah and or the, you know these people that want to come out and go to a pride parade but they don't want drag queens marching in the pride uh -huh, parade uh -huh. or they don't want people in leather uh -huh. or lesbians or on bikes uh -huh. so they their idea of coming out is still stuck in this respectability, mm -hmm. politics. And HIV has been bogged down by respectability politics. The good person. Yeah. The person who didn't know any better and got HIV and it wasn't their fault and their boyfriend cheated on them and all of those sort of stories that we hear. <laughs> and we need to break that so that people can say, yeah, I was a whore and I took 50 loads and I had a great time and maybe I got HIV. Who Same. cares? Like, there's, like, an activist in, in, in Argentina, and I think he says that, and also, like, sort of take that part from him. And also, another activist in Mexico, Michelle said it, is, like, when they ask, when they ask us, like, how do you catch, they say, how do you catch HIV? We just say, like, oh, from the ass. You know, like, <laughs> in Spanish, it has more sound, like, ¿Dónde lo agarraste? Ah, por el culo. Uh -huh. O sea, what do you want me to tell you? You know, I was just fucking, and somebody, like, I don't know, like, I don't know who, but, and I don't care, and I still want to get more fucks, you know, like. 
Well, and that's always been the challenge with, for lack of a better word, minority communities, is that we always have to explain ourselves. Sí. Like, why are you in this room? Why are you in this meeting? Why are you in this job? Why are you, you know, we always have to explain. And the same thing with HIV, particularly if you're brown and queer, mm. there's this need, this reflexive action to say, oh, I got it, but I'm sorry. Uh -huh. sí, sí, Forgive sí. me. Sí, sí. I'll be better. <laughs> it uh, was my bad moment of my life or something like that. Yeah, or blame, you know, uh -huh. blame a boyfriend or blame drugs or, or whatever. Instead of saying, yeah, of course I got this. And this has always been my frustration around HIV, particularly for queer people of color, is that HIV happens because of the conditions in which we live. Mm -hmm. uh, so the statistics that I mentioned earlier, this idea that black gay men have a one in two chance of getting HIV. Um. They have a one in two chance of getting HIV before they wake up in the morning, before they leave the house. So how do you possibly expect someone to stay negative when they have a one in two chance of getting HIV? And how do you possibly blame them for getting it? Because the conditions in which we live have made it so it's very likely that we'll get HIV. We have 40 years of a pandemic that hasn't had an appropriate and adequate response, of course people are going to get HIV. Mm. I'm surprised more people don't get HIV. Mm. And so we need to also put it in that context of, of seeing it in terms of the conditions that have created it. I mean, MPOX is another example, yeah. recent example, sí. and it affected in the U.S., mostly black and brown gay men, mm. and who was getting the who had the most access to vaccines? Yeah. Not black and brown exactly. gay men. So history repeats itself. See, sí. see, sí, see. Sí. No, I, I agree with you. I mean, now, like, like it's just like people want to blame those groups of people and also say like, uh, don't fuck. Or stop fucking. You know, stop spreading the virus. Whatever if it's doesn't matter if it's Mpox, HIV, or whatever. But this is still sort of like one point, like blaming on them. But secondly, it's also like um, saying that if you are part of this group, you don't deserve to have pleasure and sex. Like you don't deserve it because you are the one who are actually infecting everyone. Ah, but like these other ones who have access, but we don't see that they have access because we don't want to see that. It's just like we believe that they're just like clean. You know, I mean, the white people or other people, you know, it's just, you know, like you create even like an narrative about that about those groups of people that are like more more vulnerable i mean that's how healthcare has been constructed right you're lucky you're lucky you have access to treatment so you better be a good person uh -huh. see sí, no in mexico is the same we have to make a better case for the value of the sex that we're having because for 40 years there's been this expectation that because of hiv gay men should just stop having sex same that you should not only stop having sex, but you should give up having sex that you find to be pleasurable mm -hmm. and intimate, such as sex without condoms or fluid exchange. And there was never a debate about whether we should give that up. It was just expected. Give it up. Mm. Because everything else is more important. But, and this is where the work needs to be done, but if you ask gay men, most of us are willing to risk a lot, if not everything, for sex, and good sex, and pleasurable sex. And we do it every day of our lives, whether it's risking HIV, risking an STI, risking getting mugged in a park where you're cruising, risking getting arrested in a country where same-sex sexual behavior is criminalized, we navigate risk in the context of sex every single day. And we continue to do it because it matters that much. Mm. And it's that simple. And if people can't understand that, then fuck them. But the reality is our sex matters so much to us that we're willing to risk these things. We're willing to accept these risks. 
And that's at the heart of who we are. Risk in a heterosexual context is seen as macho, as masculine. Mm. So a good man risks things. He risks things in sports. He risks things riding a horse. He risks things in financial markets. He risks things when it comes to dating women. Yeah. Risk is a demonstration of your masculinity if you're heterosexual. Risk if you're gay men is a demonstration of your pathology. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what's gotten us precisely. Precisely. So we need to embrace this perceived idea of perversion instead of running away from it. And mm. HIV activists have done that and queer Latinx people living with HIV has done that and we've talked to some of them mm. who are willing to say, fuck yeah, I'm a pervert. I'm a whore. I'm all of these things that you think I am. I don't mm. care if you think that because I'm living the life that I want to live. Mm. And at the end of the day, that's all we can do. I think the only answer that we have to this or for a situation where like uh, everything is always not against you, but like sort of like targeting you or labeling you in the negative part of society, you know, like the pervert or like the the one who has a disease or like whatever, you know. Uh, I think the only answer for that is pride. And yeah, pride. I don't have any other option. I mean, they're yeah, building community, blah, blah, blah. But I think pride is the first seed that we need to start with a bigger thing. So for you as an individual, as a person living with HIV, how do you, what does pride look like? How do you think you manifest it? Well, I think, um, I think pride is just like, uh, I want to say like embracing who you are, which is part of it, of course, but it's more like about um, don't giving a fuck about other things, about what people think about you or what society or what like the system, what, you know, like, because it doesn't necessarily mean that you're embracing everything who you are, but it's more about like um, doing whatever you want to do without giving a fuck, you know, like, how do you think you do that? In, as a person well I mean, I mean if I call myself he'd also in any space for example you know like would be I mean, of course in my, with empathy it's easier for life, but like if I do it like in front of with a new date you know like when I'm dating someone or like hooking up or like in a conference or like in I don't know whatever I think that's a way to say like yeah I'm Sidoso you know but like not caring about what people is going to think or even like talking openly about HIV doesn't have to be Sidoso it can be like just HIV when I'm cooking up or like, you know, about the topic, uh, having sex, having sex is basically the way that I also like, don't care, you know, like it's like, I want to have sex, very bad sex. The act of having sex. The act of having sex, the act of having, of doing cruising, for example, that's something that I like cruising, you know, like. How does it make you feel when you do that or when you use the word sidoso in those environments? Like, what do you... <clears throat> if, you know, I, I, I'm trying. I want to. I want people to sort of understand your experience, right? How does it make you feel? What do you when you do it? When people react to you, like, what's the experience like? Sometimes it's like um, just like a pleasure of like sort of like just like being myself. You know, like it's pleasurable because like it gives you like it's happiness, but also power. I think that depend, the level of power depends on like the context or the situation where you say it, you know. But in general, it's power. Power about like, oh yeah, I can say it, you know. Like, um, I sort of own the narrative, and now people is gonna depend, or like their people's narrative about HIV, it's gonna depend about what I say, not about what they say or what they think. And that's actually just with a word, you just change everything. You don't have to say, oh, HIV, la, 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 la. It's just like, I'm a Sidoso and I live with HIV and great. So people probably, it's going to say like, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> but that's just like a change of narrative and that's power. You know, like, you don't have to take it. You just take it. I mean, you don't have to take it from someone. 
you just take it because sometimes it's just there we just need like to and that's been I think that's been the theme in every conversation that we've had in this podcast is mm -hmm. how do you claim power not take power from someone else exactly. but claim power through your body your sexuality your gender expression your performance your art all of that is an opportunity to claim one's power and HIV see though so all of it is another opportunity to claim that power not only for yourself but for the community that we're working for the community that we're building the community that we're strengthening the community that we're representing so that power doesn't have to just stay with you it can be a tool that we can use to make things better okay i think we are just like coming to the very end not just of the episode but like the whole podcast um i think this conversation needed to happen uh i mean um from impact with work with HIV, especially oh, focus on queer people around the world, gay, okay, bisexual, and queer men. And I think for us, it's very important to talk about HIV, and I'm very happy we just had this conversation. I mean, I think this has been a, an exceptional series of episodes, and to be able to meet and have conversations with, with so many different, diverse, interesting, exciting, people only reinforces that one the sort of incredibleness of our community the strength and power uh, of our community but the opportunity and potential mm -hmm. that we all have to make an impact or raise our voices or create something together and this podcast has been part of that creating something that amplifies the voices and experiences of our community. In that sense, it's part of this much larger movement around what it means to be queer and Latinx. Well, thank you everyone for like listening to this podcast, this whole series of episodes. Um, thank you, Alex. Thank you. And well, see you. Adios. Ciao.